All right, welcome to another episode of the Ari Lewis Show here on Israel Sports News Radio. It's also good to be on the YouTube channel, the Zodder Shem, the Nation of Israel YouTube page. Very excited to have everyone aboard. You can also email us, Ari Lewis Show at Hotmail.com. Uh, great guest this evening. You know, for a long time, I wanted to discuss the concept of Torah in Hollywood and Hollywood movies because people say Jews control Hollywood, but you take a look at most movies and it doesn't seem such a Torah type of view, but sometimes Torah ideas are snuck in, so I figured really can't have a better guest than tonight's guest, Mordecai ben Avraham, who is an Orthodox Jew, but used to be involved in the Hollywood uh, scene, uh, produced a lot of uh, productions in Hollywood, so I figured great to have him on the show, so thank you for being here this evening. Great, Art. it's great to be here, it's uh, exciting. So I wanted to start with this concept, I mentioned to Svi this earlier, that there's a Midrash regarding uh, Yaakov Avinu finding out that his son Yosef was alive after all these years. Mm. So his daughter, uh, Serak, plays a harp very slowly and says... His granddaughter. His granddaughter, Yosef is still alive because they didn't want to freak him out. And I have this idea that God puts ideas into these Jewish writers' minds in Hollywood so they can express those ideas in movies. So people are going to a movie, they want to relax, but then they get these ideas of, of Torah uh, of point of, points of view. So first of all, did you ever notice that at all in your time in Hollywood, that kind of these ideas are in there? Did you think, oh, it's interesting. Why is that in a movie? Why is this in a movie? Did you ever notice that at all from your experience? Um, yeah, I, I mean, like, e even like this, like, you know, I, I converted to Judaism, so, like, one of the ideas that really hit me was just the whole idea of the exodus and like in the secular world something like this would be like a sci-fi movie right right like the whole thing and leaving and the splitting of the red sea the plagues the whole thing but in the jewish world that's a reality i mean that's like what my ancestors did that's what you know we we went through that's why i'm here right now so i think that idea of the supernatural and miracles and supernatural experiences are like a part of the Jewish Masura and that and that and that idea has been transferred over creatively by our artists specifically um, in Hollywood and I was gonna say even like the concept of the movie theater itself mm. the fact that you're, you're you walk into a room and you're sitting down and you're watching this screen, and then the screen is invoking different emotions out of you. That could even parallel like our lives in general. Like we're watching a movie that Hashem has created, and we kind of like judge by how we respond to each scene. Hmm. Ever so idea? Because apparently, it's this idea that at the end of the person's life, they'll watch their own life, but don't realize it's them. I think Rabbi Nachman talks about this, and then they'll say the person's good or bad, and then it's turned back to, well, that was you. So mm -hmm. it's interesting this this analogy of watching a movie. Also, in TV shows, there are these interesting Jewish ideas that pop in. You know, I'm not going to, I don't want to lie to people. I did watch a lot of Seinfeld episodes. Randomly, at one point, Kramer and George are having a conversation, and Kramer talks about he's not worried about anything. And George says, you know, it's people like you that live to 120. I'm like, oh. You know, so that's none of these ideas that seem to be stuck into TV shows and movies. These simple Jewish ideas that if you're from, you're like, oh, yeah, I see what that's, that's talking to. Well, even, um, even there was an article written in a Jewish journal, I think, like, I don't know, like maybe like several years ago now, and the whole article was talking about the uh, MGM Studios and how the MGM Studios had a lot of immigrants that were from Europe that were writers and playwrights, and they hired them to work for MGM, Jewish, Jewish writers, Jewish playwrights that were from Europe. Right. And, and, and a lot of the, the early TV shows about, you know, the good guy against the bad guy, the cowboys, and one guy's wearing all black, one guy's wearing white, right. and... The, the, all the stories about the good guy always wins at the end, they said those movies shaped a lot of the, the moral and ethical standards of America. Sure. That they saw being virtuous and they saw being good people, but those were inspired by um, Jewish writers. And, um, and, and has a lot to do with, you know, what America perceives itself as today came from those early um, stories. You know, it's funny because uh, Rabbi Sparrow is a rabbi I look up to a lot. He says it's interesting that Hollywood is a Jewish place, but it's not from the Torah, but still somehow these ideas come and they come out and they influence the whole world. So Light Into the Nations, it still occurs even in Hollywood. So let's break this down. We're gonna go through a number of movies and wanna talk about Jewish ideas that I picked up a bit and probably you as well. So let's start first with Star Wars. Mm. I'll point out two Jewish ideas that I saw in that. So 
random scene that it, t it turns out to be very pivotal. Obi-Wan Kenobi is fighting Darth Vader, they're going back and forth. And at one point, Obi-Wan Kenobi sees Luke Skywalker, he stops and he says something to the effect of, you know if you kill me that'll just make me stronger, something like that. And then he holds a sword like this and Darth Vader kills him. And then he becomes more of a spiritual mentor to Luke. And it's this concept that the Sadiq is more powerful after he dies than while he's alive. Mm. So there's one idea I noticed in Star Wars. Another one is the concept of repentance, because at the end of the third movie, when Darth Vader repents, then he turns back into Anakin Skywalker before he did all that bad stuff. He's in the clouds. He's with Obi-Wan Kenobi, the guy he killed, but now they're friends again. So this concept of Teshuba, that he can now return and be the person he was supposed to be. Mm. Did you know anything, notice anything else in Star Wars? And also you can talk about the two ideas that I shared about it. Yeah, um, first of all, definitely the ideas that um, you said, and, you know, but even the ideas, and, and, and the point is the saying, I, I don't think we're trying to inspire people to go and see movies, we're just right. more so, yeah. we're so, we're more so just like saying like, you know, when you're looking at the world, look for God, right? And so like from that premise, like you, even in Star Wars, it's like the idea of, you know, being a person without an identity, and then over time finding out that you have this special purpose mm. and you have this special ability and you know you sometimes have to travel far away to be able to gain that ability and be kind of isolated and work with a teacher and be able to you know you hear a constant theme is trusting the force right yeah right trusting the force Luke yeah. trust the force and having this responsibility to like you said to help your brethren you know, to help the nation that you came from, from disaster. And you doing that by elevating yourself and trusting the force and going through this transformational process, I think is like a very, um, very Jewish. And, and I think what you're saying is just the idea that this person evolved through a passed down tradition mm. of being a Jedi, you know, and a, right. Je a Jedi being a person who could fight the darkness and see through the darkness and be able to challenge the darkness and ov ultimately overcome it in being a single individual, you know, and then even him, his sister being concealed like Esther. Yes. You know, and being this princess. Right. And, and ultimately doing kind of like the Esther Malka work inside, you know, and helping Luke get through where he needed to get to and eventually joining him with like Mordecai and, you know, really, um, you thought about that? That part, that is great. I did not think about that. That's mm. true. Concealed mm. princess, and she ends up helping save the world as well. Yeah. There's also this aspect where Darth Vader, at the end of the first movie, sorry, I'm a little bit of nervous Star Wars, but only four, five, and six. I didn't watch the first three episodes. I just couldn't do it. But four, five, and six, I watched them a lot. So at the end of the fourth episode, what happens is Darth Vader's riding behind Luke. He's like, ooh, the Force is powerful with this guy. He noticed a certain energy to Luke, mm. but maybe Luke didn't realize that right away as well. You're mentioning that. Mm. And he needed a, a mentor, or we'd say like a Rebbe, to kind of bring it out of him. Yeah. There's that aspect as well, you notice. Well, yeah, and it, it, it reminds us of like when uh, Joseph's brothers, you know, came and um, they were trying to, Joseph was saying, oh, you got to leave Benjamin, and they were thinking about like raging war. And he went to pull, one of the brothers went to pull out of his sword, the Madrashim, went to pull his sword, and he couldn't pull it out. So he said, there must be something righteous about this man that huh. we're talking to. So whatever, but yeah, those, those, um, those type of ideas are just... 100%. But the thing is, everything that's truthful in the world is reflective of the Torah. Now, every story, you know what I mean? Whether it's a poem or a story in Hollywood, everything is reflective of the Torah. The Torah is like, like if, if there was a way to like pull the curtain off of the illusionary world and we could just see Hashem, everything that the Torah asks us to do would just make total sense. You know, we wouldn't even, everybody would be froom and not even think twice about it. Well, that's part of the Star Wars theme as far as trust in the instincts, like with Luke, because, for example, when it's revealed to him that his uh, that the princess is his sister, mm -hmm. he kind of like, and then even, he's like, yeah, that's right. She's like, yeah, that's right, too. They both, when they thought about it, it made sense. They had the truth inside of them all yeah, along. Yeah, exactly. That's another aspect. One more thing about Star Wars, sorry, I know it's a little nerdy, we'll, we'll continue other movies. So, uh, even though I didn't watch the first three episodes, I am aware that Anakin at one point was a decent guy, and the reason why he went to the bad side was... He was freaked out that something would happen to his wife, so that's he tapped into that. That's why he wanted to save her. So he actually had a noble reason. And there's a lot of this concept that the villain 
story, the origin story. Actually, the guy was a decent guy. And he, he was trying to do good and just kind of went in the wrong direction. So talk about that aspect. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I think even even that, that powerful idea, like, I think a lot of, like, Bartruvas could relate to it. It's like they had parents maybe who weren't very connected or maybe not connected at all or maybe even anti. And a part of them achieving their completion is kind of like going to war with those aspects of their parents, those ideas. And so, like, Luke Skywalker is literally going to war... That's his own father. ...with his father. Right. But maybe not Dafka, like, the father in the physical sense, but those attributes that he's trying to let go of to become this pure vessel that he needed to be to save the world. And he saved his father, saved his soul. And then ultimately he, 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 saved, he saved his father. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very deep. I mean, it's one of those things that we could probably even go through scene by scene or chapter by chapter and find so many different Mishailim inside of it. Yeah, so again, uh, there's a reason why Star Wars movies were so popular and they're, they're still popular, still watched uh, continually. Again, uh, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on the Nation of Israel YouTube page and also YouTube channel, excuse me, and also Israel Sports and News Radio. My guest this evening is Mordecai Ben Avram. So we're going to now talk about the Indiana Jones movies because I know you're big mm. fans of those. Mm. Obviously, there's some strong Jewish ideas. First of all, I mean, the Nazis are trying to take over the world. They want the Ark. Yeah. That, 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 that That's it. it that's got to stick out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know Steven Spielberg directed it, you know, if you're into Jewish conspiracies, but right there, you got to <laughs> think, well, what's going on there? The most fascinating part for me of those movies is, actually, there's two real strong points, but one point where they're going to open up the Ark, somehow, Indiana Jones says, we, we can't look at this. Look away. Yeah. And then the Nazis die from that. He was able to figure out that if it's too intense holiness, we just can't look at it. We have these ideas as well. Moshe can't look directly to God's face, these type of things. Uh, what other aspects? Aaron's use? sons. Aaron's sons, right? Mm. Uh, the alien fire, etc. Was there anything in particular you noticed with that scene, or, or just the movies in general, that you, that you connected to? I think the fact that, you know, he was looking for, he and the Nazis both were both looking for this supernal power. And, you know, like, there's a famous idea that we could learn, we could learn things from the wicked in a lot of mm. ways. And it's like, you, you think about it, like the Nazis were so aggressive about not just territorial, but they were looking for historical artifacts. They were looking for even spiritual devices to give them additional powers in this world. I think there's even a story about, I heard about um, Hitler Maximo that he was trying to build a military base on the, on the moon. That's what, that's what the, his whole NASA program wow. was about building, getting to the moon and building a military base so they could fire rockets back to the Earth. I did not know that. All right. Yeah. He's shaking his head. He knew that. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Know that. Uh, wow. Yeah. That's what his whole NASA program came from that. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's jokes yeah. about Nazi moon bases. And Nazi moon bases. Okay. Wow. So, but I'm saying, yeah. but if you think about it, like, as, as, as spiritual people, as good people, as people who want to see unity and, and want to see God's name elevate in this world, we could learn from that and, and, and maybe even have the same ambitions. To right. If the evil are doing something that ambitious, so the good should do it as well. Even more so. Even more so. Okay. Well, so that uh, other Jewish ideas. First of all, I remember watching this movie um, with my mom, and there's a part where the Nazis are trying to give these gifts to these people, and they say, this is from some of the finest families in Germany. Mom's like, yeah, because they stole it from the Jews exactly. there. So another Jewish idea. So this this concept, the Nazis are doing evil things to try to conquer the world, yeah. basically, in a nutshell. Another aspect I found, uh, we'll, we'll try to be careful to say this, but this is with Sean Connery, where Indiana Jones has to, he kind of has to step on God's name, but in letters, but it is not in, in Hebrew. And... He says God's name, but with the J, so I don't want to say it. So even then, another idea of a movie, they put in God's name in, in, a, in a movie. The people yeah. are trying to get entertained, and they see God's name. So talk about that aspect. Yeah, like, I mean, the God's name, but even there was even, uh, to add to what you're saying, it's like there was even parts, Indian and Jones, when they went in certain places, in the whole physical, it was all controlled spiritually. And there were spirits coming out, and, and lost souls, and old souls, and, and, and demonic forces, and they were, like, dealing... That was that was a part of the process, but the point is the saying like, the key to I think the the idea of Indiana Jones is like, he was looking for a treasure. Okay. And he had to go and discover it, and he had to go through a process, and he had to go against evil, and the evil was trying to, to stop him from doing that, and and I think that could be connected to, you know, us finding our purpose. 
you know, in this world. It's like everyone's like, we all have a treasure that we're supposed to give to the world. But we got to find that treasure, excuse me. And that treasure is inside of us. That treasure is our uniqueness. And so we live in a world that wants to convince us to live a different way, you know, to convince us to not, you know, go in the path of righteousness and to kind of just follow our desires. And that could be expressed to the Nazis, hmm. you know, and they're going towards our treasure too, but they want to take it for themselves. Ah, uh, okay. Right? So more of a selfish perspective. Selfish perspective, and, and, and I'm saying, and for us, there's a world that wants to convince us to be away from Hashem, and so that world is trying to take away from our uniqueness. And so it's our job to kind of like battle, and I mean, there's parts in Ian and Jones where it's like, there were invisible stairs, I mean, invisible steps to get from one side of a mountain to another, right? And he like picked up some dust and he threw it, and it was the stairs, I mean, it was these, uh, this road or, or um, pathway in front of him that you couldn't see with your eyes. And I think a person who follows the Torah is saying like, okay, how am I going to get married? How am I going to make pranasa? How am I going to do these different things? And it doesn't seem like it in front of us. You know, it doesn't seem like, well, how am I going to do this? But if we just keep walking straight, that road is in front of us, even if we can't see it. Well said. One more thing about Indiana Jones. This is for our friends, uh, Christian friends out there watching, Christian audience. In Search the Holy Grail, very interesting historical fact is that they try to say, oh, which cup is Jesus' cup? And they try to get this nice fancy one, disaster, fancy one, disaster. And then they notice, oh, that's the cup of a carpenter. So mm. historically, there's something there about the humility, the importance of humility, that it doesn't have to be some fancy gold cup. Mount Sinai was not the biggest mountain in Egypt. Mm. So there's uh, that aspect as well. The importance of humility is shown also in those movies. 100%. And the, just the idea that there was a holy grail, you know, and that holy grail was like, I mean, the holy grail, that's, that's, that's our lucos, you know, that's our, that's the codes inside of the Torah, you know. I'm sure we're going to talk about other things that bring out those codes more, but those secret codes that open up the true reality, you know, that's the, um, that's the Holy Grail we're looking for. All right, again, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on the Nation of Israel YouTube page and also IsraelSportsNewsRadio.com. Our guest this evening is Mordechai Ben Avram. I want to talk about the movie Ghost. Uh, I know it's not so sci-fi, but this idea of the afterlife, good and evil, we see a very touching uh, scene when uh, Patrick Swayze, sorry to give away the movie people haven't seen it but it came out in 1989 so that's on you if you haven't seen it but Patrick Swayze when he dies uh, well actually actually when he's about to go to heaven he sees the light and then the bad guys they go to a, to a different place the concept that even people that physically passed on still could communicate to people that are here in this world so some of the things you notice in Ghost yeah yeah um, you know these are like very high level things you know what I mean so like I'm, I'm saying it with a lot of humility but there's a famous idea, there was um, the Magid Dov Bear, he wrote a, a kuntras, a pamphlet for his Talmidim to go, how to properly go to different Kever Siddiquim, and how to, you know, how to go and, and connect to different ideas when you go and visit a, a righteous person, you know, and how those ideas could help elevate a person's soul or give them great appreciation. But one of the things he said, he was writing about it, he says, uh, Rabbi Isaac Luria, the Arizal, brought tremendous ideas of how to do many things in the Jewish world, how to observance, philo philosophical, hashkafa, all types of things. And he said that a lot of the Ari's ideas came from him visiting or sending different, him vi physically visiting different Kever Siddiquim or sending students to Kever Siddiquim, and he would actually communicate to those souls like if he went to visit a particular Tana and he had a question inside say the, the Talmud about a particular area he would go and visit that particular Tana and ask him at the gravesite and he would come that Tana would come and give him the information and that's what he would come back and teach his students and that's what Chaim Vital would write, would write down oh wow so the Magad Dober said most of what the Arizal brought came from his ability to communicate to the Siddiquim from um, the other side from the other side yeah wow okay so, and by the way, I'm not much of a crier, but I, I do admit at the end of the movie, I did cry when he said he loved Molly. It was pretty sweet. It was a pretty nice touch. The concept that love still extends, even uh, between yeah. both worlds as well. All right, but, okay, so enough of those, uh, the romance movies. We'll talk about some other stuff. Obviously, have to talk about The Matrix. A lot of Jewish themes there. Neo, if you go the other way, O-N-E, one. He appears to be the Mashiach uh, in those movies. And one of my friends, I remember, again, I'm one of the few people on the planet that has not seen the Matrix movies, but it's been explained to me so many times I feel like I've seen it. So a friend of mine, the first time he explained uh, the movie, clue if you're out there watching, 
I said, okay, well, why do they make sequels? The answer to the movie is Meshach, that's that. So why did they make the sequels? And he said, $500 million. But talk about your aspects, mm -hmm. uh, your, excuse me, your perspective, where the Jewish value of Neil being the one, he realizes that he is the one, that's a big part of the movie, my understanding, and that is the kind of climax of the first movie. So talk about uh, some of your thoughts about it. Yeah, the first it was a really great movie. Um, you know, that, I, when I look at the, the Matrix, I mean, I, I look at that as like conversion. You know, when someone converts to Judaism, maybe Baal Tshuva, but even more so conversion, it's like he has a choice. Like he's living in the world and everything is like kind of like artificial. It's not real. And, um, and so when it comes to him, he's just living an everyday life, you know, working, li working cubicle. And then some guy comes to him and says like, hey, you have this greater purpose. You know, you're supposed to, you know, see the true reality of the world. And you're supposed to be a part of this true reality of the world. And, and he gives him the option to take these two pills, right? And it's kind of like, that's the idea of like, coming closer to Judaism, is this idea of, of saying like, you know what, do I want to live in the false reality? Do I want to live in a reality where there's this pathway to happiness, and this pathway to pleasure, and this pathway to all these promises that the world gives us, but none of them are true? Hmm. There's not one commercial that I see on television that is actually giving me what it says that it's, it's, it's providing for me. Meaning that if I buy this car, it's not going to make me happy. If I go on vacation there, it's not going to give me peace. If I date this girl who looks this way, that's not going to get me to the, the, the place of, of, of connection to God through a relationship. None of these things are true, but they're selling me this all the time, nonstop. So this character, Neo in this movie literally decides that he's gonna go on the other side and then he takes a pill, right? And then that pill, you know, it's kind of metaphorical in the movie, allows the guy who comes to him, uh, it was Morpheus, Morpheus to come to him and then take him into this other world, right? And then he goes in this other world and the first thing that they do is they sit him down in this chair and they plug his brain up with all these different, like, um, you know, like, nodes. like, what do you call them, nodes? No, nodes. You know, like nodes. nodes nodes plugs in the whole process he's educating himself so it's like almost like he was going to like a yeshiva huh. and he's just sitting there receiving all this info he's getting all the information of the world he's and getting Lawrence fishburn is like his rebbe in that case Lawrence fishburn yeah is, 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 is my good share you know okay. and and like and so but he's receiving all this information and this information allows him to go back into sight go back into the matrix and become one of the fighters to like change the whole system and that phrase, the Matrix, is used continually by a lot of front people. I'm happy I'm out of the Matrix for Yeah, yeah, yeah. said a lot. Uh, by the way, you know, as a side note, because I did a little research for this movie, so uh, even though I haven't watched it, but Will Smith was actually offered that part first, turned it down, took Wild Wild West was a flop. I think that was a mistake, Will. But anyway, Keanu Reeves took it and did, it, did a great job. So there's that aspect. And then, again, for our Christian audience, people want to argue that it's a Christian point of view. They'd say the... Trinity is uh, there's a character named Trinity in that movie. That's the girl he, he he got married to or whatever. So there's that you know that aspect, but even then, that would still have the the uh, Jewish origin. So uh, also with the Matrix, that it's my understanding. So the second and third movies, mm. what would how would that, from your perspective, say that's a Jewish perspective, Taurus perspective, etc. You know, I just think it's just this continuous journey. Like um, Rabbi Hirsch, he. Um, he speaks about it in some of his essays and even in some of the commentaries in the Chumash. But he talks about like how the, the Jewish people, like even though we're living amongst everyone else, all the other nations, we're living in a completely different reality. You know, we're living in a different time system. We have a different way we evaluate time. Like right now, this is the beginning of the day. Right, and that's it, right. Right now, like yeah, we're, right. In the after, we're in the afternoon, so it's the past Shkia, right? Yeah. So we're in a new day. For the non-Jewish world, their day doesn't start till tomorrow. Right. After midnight, in most cases, and yeah. other cases, when the sun rises. Right. So Our we're point. living in a time. Our 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 calendar yeah. is going on a solar a sol, a solar lunar system, as where the non-Jewish world is living on a solar system. And if say if, even if say you're Muslim, you're living on just the lunar system. Right. We live in a completely time mechanism, than everyone else. The foods that we eat have to be dealt with in a certain way. We eat our diet as completely different than everyone else. And so, so when you think about 
this idea of like leaving the matrix and living in an alternate reality. This is what the Jew is doing every day. This is what God has commanded the Jew to not be a part of the matrix. Now, there's an interesting part about the movie is that there's a character in the movie who actually is sick of being in the matrix, uh, sick, sick of being outside of the matrix, and he's a, he, he's against it, and he's trying to undermine it, and he actually joins the agents. Huh. These Satan characters that are in the Matrix that are trying to keep the Matrix knowing. He joins them, and, and there's a powerful scene in that movie where he's like eating steak. And he, and, he, and, and he says, even though I know this steak isn't real, I'm still enjoying it. He says, ignorance is bliss. Yeah, and wow. he says, ignorance is bliss. That's what he says. This okay. is in the movie. And so it's like, it's like sometimes, you know, our brethren, they get so caught up into this world that it's not even fulfilling. Like, you're eating that steak... And that steak is not even, there's no Kedusha connected to that snake. That, I mean, snake. That's, <laughs> that, that steak, is, there, there's no Kedusha connected to it. It's not elevated. You're living in a time system that's totally illusionary. It's not even real. But you want to join into that? You want to take on the ideas of being anti-Israel because that's what everyone is saying and that's the new in vogue thing to do is to be against this. You know, people 30, 34 years ago, they were against black people. Would you join them too? You know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just saying like, it's just... That idea of being in the matrix and, 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 and fighting to keep it going, knowing that it's never going to fulfill your soul. And I think that movie touches on that point. It's uh, something to really reflect on. For all of us, all of us may have a part of us that still wants to be in the matrix a little bit, you know, that wants to still, like, you know, be outside the matrix. But, but So what's the reason for that? Why would someone want to be in the matrix, especially if they know it's not true? I mean, what is the advantage of that? Is it just a break, a vacation, something they don't have to worry about if they're you, you in know, that place? When the, when, the, when, the, when the Torah talks about idolatry, and it talks about Avada Zara and these different ideas, you know, there's a famous concept, which is, you know, what is the root concept of Avada Zara? Like, it's not that people are just dafka worshiping a stone or a, a cross or anything like that. They're saying that there is a universe and there is a whole system of things going around, but I'm going to go to this source to be able to achieve my, my connection. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to use this filament. Like, the famous idea is, like, when people, like, uh, like say if a person went to a store, right? A person went to a store, and um, and they went to a cashier and tried to negotiate a price. Well, like in Israel sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but the point is, it's saying if you really want to negotiate the price, you would go to the store owner. Yes, right. Right. So the person who's into Vadazara is a person who's willing who's willing to go to a intermediary to achieve what only God can give. Huh. And it gives them a certain level of ego. It gives them a certain level of the sense of control and these different things. And so I think, um, you know, when people go along with the mob, you know, when they go along with popular ideas, there's a certain fulfillment that comes with being a part of the collective. Even if the collective is like mob theory, right? Like people are part of a mob and there's a big fight breaks out and everyone just starts fighting, you know? So I think a lot of people just get caught up into being accepted and feeling safe and feeling like they have a sense of control by being a part of, you know, the masses. You know, I'm sure not everybody in Germany hated Jews, but you know what? The Nazis were the most powerful force at that time. They went along with it. You know, I'm sure everybody in America wasn't racist against black people, right? There were even white people that protested. But during the times of slavery and after that, there were people who saw injustice happen and they sat and watched it. Right. So the point is, the saying there's something inside of human nature that will go along with the collective and the mass, even if it goes against our value system. Because that's something that I bring up a lot is that if you look throughout history, when evil people do something, it's a very small percentage of the population. Even the, the example with the Nazis, talk about five, ten percent of the German population was in that party. But the problem is, the good people when they do nothing. Yeah. That is really what causes problems. So I yeah, hope everyone. Yeah learns that his lesson from history because we're going through a little bit of that right now. Again, my guest is Mordecai Ben Avraham. This is the Ari Lewis Show on Israel Sports News Radio.com, also a YouTube channel, The Nation of Israel. So let's talk about the Truman Show. And the reason why I want to bring this up, of all the movies, I was kind of freaked out by this one and I'll tell you why. So a couple years ago I was at a meeting with one of my rabbis and he said something that freaked me out to this day. I'm still trying to process this lesson. But he basically said a shem arranges your veras. I mean, he means to say the test, but meaning 
anyone that commits an Avera, they think, perhaps, this is outside of God. I can choose to be outside of God, but you still can't. If you want to eat pork, God has to have that store be open, has to have the refrigerator on, electricity connect, he has to have the roads open for you, he has to have the bus take you there, the car, whatever. He allows you to sin, and that kind of freaks me out. Because you think that that's not what's happening. But even then, he's still in control. He's still watching. That's what the Truman Show is about, is that he is always being watched. So what did you take away from that movie? I think even on a point that you're seeing, it's like when you think about the idea of a Vera, right? So like in, an, in, in the non-Jewish world, they think of this idea of sin. You do something wrong and you're going to be punished for it, right? As were us, a Vera, the root of the, the, that word, it, it means to disconnect, Right? So we do something that disconnects us from the light force of God. So there's two aspects of that. One aspect is the challenge to not do, right? You know, whatever the very is, maybe someone shouldn't eat something they shouldn't eat or look at something. They have this temptation, so they have that dynamic. God forbid a person fa fails at it, but say they fail, right? So they failed that part. But then there's another part of the test, which is the most important part of the test, is just how you respond after you make that mistake. Mm. And after you respond, that really determines the person and their ability to grow from a life experience. Because, like, I, I remember reading a Rabbi Nachman book, I mean, um, R uh, Rabbi Arush. I read one of his books, and he was saying that us not having success for, for something was already pre-designed. Right. It's already there. So the question is, if that's the case, how are we going to respond? If, if Hashem is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and he's going to say something, how are we going to respond to that? We already know his heart's going to be hardened. Right? So the point is the thing in life, it's like, you know, when we have these different experiences that, you know, we have, you know, how do we respond to these experiences? How do we respond to these disconnections? And like, even like the Truman Show, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's like the concept of Malachim, right? It's the idea that like everything, like, I remember in, um, after 9-11, uh, the NSA grew tremendously in America. Yes. Right? Right. They grew tremendously uh, after that, and then they grew even more in during the Obama administration. Right, even more, yeah. Even sure. more. And so the whole idea was like, oh, man, we're going to have cameras everywhere, and people are going to be, like, on our phones, and they're going to be on, listening, our, watching our social media, and all these different types of things. And the thing is, we... We're are, being watched anyway. But I'm saying that's, a, that's the point. The point is saying that the show is creating an experience for us to be like okay wait i'm worried about the government watching me right but i'm not worried about hashem yes great point i'm not worried about like my soul there's 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 cemeteries everywhere in the world every neighborhood to some degree has a cemetery in it so that's a reminder that after 120 our souls are going to go to somewhere else right so the torah tells us how we live this life now determines that experience in the next world that's going to happen Right? The, the, even the non-Jewish world said two things are guaranteed. Death and taxes. That's it. And so, <laughs> and so the point is the same. If the non-Jewish world can understand that, for sure the Jewish world can understand. Like, why am I worried about someone listening to my phone conversations? Right. Why am I worried about this? Why am I not worried about Hashem listening to my phone conversations? Right. You know, you should live to a level, like if you have social media, that anybody who looks into what you Google, your messages on Facebook, the things you watch, everything. You shouldn't, it should be open. You shouldn't have any, they should look at it and be like, wow, this, what a righteous person. Right. But if we have things that we want to hide and things we're ashamed of, that should also remind us of the, the work we need to do. Yeah, because this is something that will come up with me a lot is they'll say, you know, Ari, you know, people read your emails and they look at Facebook and WhatsApp and I'm like, yeah, so? Like, doesn't that bother you? God sees it, I mean, why would I care about the Shabbat or Masada or whatever? God sees it. I was even at a Shabbat lunch where they said, you know, this Shabbat guy, listen to this call, that call. And it was a rabbi who talked to someone else about it. I'm like, well, what about being worried about a Shem? Don't be worried about a Shabbat. Who cares? Be worried about a Shem. So that was an aspect where the Truman Show brought this really out. But here's the thing that kind of freaked me out. The Truman Show, in this, he has a script set up for him where he's consistently seeing certain people for whatever reason. Uh, it's being orchestrated by a man named Christoph in that movie, which is a play off the phrase Christoph. Again, that's more the kind of Christian concept. But the idea that I'm seeing certain people for certain reasons, could be a reincarnation concept, whatever it may be, and then there's something I need to do with that. That's something I took away from the movie. What, what did you take that apart as well? Do you see that as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. I, I mean, I, I just... 
You know, I think it goes back to that idea we were talking about with Indiana Jones, which is this idea of finding your uniqueness, right? The whole idea with the Truman Show was just about, you know, having, like, living in a reality of compliance, where there was a certain reality, there was a certain script that you're supposed to live, and this whole thing. I think we can all relate to that now. Yeah, yeah, everyone can relate to it, and it's like, but at the same time, that's not why we came into this world. Right, and he rejects it. And that was his challenge. Yes. He realized that this was fake, and that's the thing I want to play out, that Christoph, if you do a little more research about it, that was kind of trying to say he was an evil god, if that makes sense, and eventually Truman was able to figure that out. And one of the best lines of the whole movie, he said, there was never a camera in my head. He always knew who he really was at the end of the day. And he kind of had a sense everything was fake, that's why he drove the car. He's like, huh, how come there's not a traffic jam now? And then his wife said, is this, you're blaming me? Should I blame you? Like, he could sense something. And when he was able to leave that, that exits part, the, the Ed Harris character says, it's fake out there too. And, but he decided to leave anyway. He wanted to test it out and see if it'd be real. And, and is that analogy perhaps to Olam Haba? Olam, Olam Haba, another name for Olam Haba is Olam Emmet. Is it worth Yeah, 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 D definitely not. But it's just like, I think when you look at these movies that we're both talking about, there's a consistent theme in it, which is this is the reality that exists and this is the reality I'm trying to get to. And then these characters are dealing with that dilemma. And I think we could look at like just the way Hashem designed the world and how Hashem designed us as people and designed the story of the world, the future story of the world that we learned through our Torah. And really see like, you know what, these, these, these conflicts that we're seeing in these movies are reflective of the human experience. And that every single person, like, I mean, for me, like, I, I mean, I could relate to living in the concept of the matrix, you know, working, doing things. You mentioned, you know, working in Hollywood. One of the reasons why I wanted to work in Hollywood is because, like, my, my dad was in the insurance business, which is very, like, you know, straight, black and white, and my mom's a professor, right? So she's an educator, she's an academic. And so, like, I wanted, I felt like, you know, I grew up watching, like, MTV and music videos and these movies and these type of things, and so I felt like there was some type of truth there that I wasn't receiving like I wanted to be around creative people I wanted to be around people who were kind of like living in a way outside of the matrix you know type of a thing and that really attracted me to want to be in the entertainment business but once I got into that I realized that that wasn't the case either mm. you know it wasn't the case it wasn't people living their truth they were living you know companies decide what people see and then they find people that coincide with that or people become that to please the company that they're trying to do business with. So the artists that you see, they're not, that's not really their lives most of the time. That's just what's hot right now and that's what they're doing it and because they, they want to work and they want to make money. And even movie makers, you know, it's like, you know, there are, I think more in the 80s they have more movies that I feel like were a little bit more truthful and more exploratory and these types of things. But in general, you know, it's just, um, it was, it was just, it, it just, it's just not, it's not re real. The stories and the promises that the movies give us, you know, the core story which invokes us is something we can relate to, but the end product is not, it's not gonna lead anyone who watches those movies or wanna imitate it, it's not gonna lead them to, you know, happiness. You know, it's not gonna lead them to self-discovery. It's not gonna lead them to truth. It may give you, it may spark something within you, but it's, it's not gonna get you there. And so I think, the core condition of humanity is fighting against the, you know, like we're in a neighborhood now, like someone thought this out, you know, the square feet of the blocks, the apartments, how much the rent was going to be, what type of people were going to rent these apartments out, the whole thing. Okay, so they, they decided that. And then there's a school system and then there's a, you know, even some cases a religious system that reinforces the belief system. But... You know, people have to go out on their own and find their truth. Even if they grew up religious, you know, they still have to, in a kosher way, you know, um, find out your own Torah. You know, more of a personal question. In your time in Hollywood, did you notice that people maybe pretended to be happy in that world, but deep down they weren't? Did you ever get that type of sense, certain sense of, of fakeness? Sometimes Hollywood has that stigma. In your personal experience, did you notice anything like that? Um, everybody's, like, drugged out. You know, okay. so it's not even like, I mean, you may see them high, but I don't think they're pretending to be happy. I just think okay. they're, they're being high. I've, almost every music artist that we can name, 
talks about being high, you know, right. and, you know, a lot of actors, you know, have maybe a little bit more of a concealed life okay. in that way because they're playing other characters, but most of their time has been high, you know, wow. and, and so it's a lot of people who are in pain there, there are a lot of... A lot of rehab situations, right? Well, it's just a lot of people who are very sensitive and have certain talents through that sensitivity that the only outlet they ever had was behind a booth in a studio or on a set or on a stage or something like this. That's the only time, like when you see an artist, uh, 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 like a small story, I, I knew these two artists, these, these two girl artists, and they were from Canada, whatever, really attractive girls, really talented. They actually had to deal with Motown, whatever. And I took them to different people in the industry, and one of the things this guy said to me, and it really blew my mind, he said to me, he's like, he said, dude, these girls are never going to be successful, even though they could see and they're very attractive. He said, why? He said, because their lives have been too good. They came from two-parent households, you know, their parents were diplomats, and, you know, they had all these privileges, and they knew how to sing, and they had singing coaches, and they have a great look. He said, but when you see, like, a Rihanna on stage or a Madonna on stage, you're seeing a woman acting out pain. Right. That that what you're seeing on stage is someone acting out pain. When you're looking at these male singers who are seductive and they're just moving around, whatever. This is a, this is them expressing like inhibited, you know, self expressions of intimacy, and self understanding and these types of things. So, most of what you see in the entertainment world is different forms of expression of pain. Even a person who's an actor. I'm not limiting actors or actors, but these are people who want to be different people. They want to experience different people. They want to live a life other than theirs, you know? And they get a, a, it's a safety point for that, and they're really good at it, you know? But we don't think about what's motivating that person. So most of the things that you see are, in, in Hollywood, most entertainment you see are different expressions of pain, whether it's the writer, whether it's Stephen King expressing different things that he had in his childhood or, you know, or, or, or an actor, you know, running away from experiences, God forbid, of even being abused as a child or a person rapping about, you know, living in complete darkness and everyone willing to kill your neighbor for, you know, a lump of cash, you know, all these things are all expressions of, of pain. And because everyone goes for it and everyone's into it, it becomes normalized, and we don't even think about pain. They even have these like um, documentaries exposing like pornography, right? And they talk about like how gruesome the experience is, and how almost like the percentage of people who were molested as children who get in pornography—not just the people who are actors, but the people who are directors and right. So all of this stuff is just expressions of pain that has become normalized. We normalize pain. We we see people doing the worst things. They're like, wow. This guy's a stud, you know, he's slept with, the, I mean, you see Bill Cosby, I mean, drugging women, I mean, it's like Hugh Hefner, Playboy Mansion, I mean, like, you have all these women there and you're taking pictures of them nude and you're making money from that? Right. It's, yeah, it's, it sounds like legalized prostitution to me. But. I'm saying it's a very sad reality. Hollywood is a very sad reality and, and we have to question ourselves if we are watching this in and we're looking at this and we're getting pleasure from it. Even if it's creative stuff and it has some tie-in, we really have to question where are we holding at that, you know, we're seeing women being sexualized and men being sexualized and violence being normalized and all these different things. I, you know, just um, we have to really look at ourselves and see, like, where, where am I connecting to this? Where is that coming from? A lot of these actors go through such turmoil. Like, for example, Heath Ledger's class example, right? Been suicide, so as an audience, it's kind of like, well, let's use the guy for his acting talents and not really care about it personally. And then when he goes, we'll get a new actor. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing to to have that approach. But even more than that, when he dies, we're going to make even more money, right? Because the movies sell more. Everything sells more. Like right. like you got this guy, this famous rapper. He's not even famous. He's kind of his rapper. This guy, Pop Smoke. Okay. I never even heard about this guy until he got murdered, right? Okay, right. This yeah. guy's like three albums out. He's the ex Extentacion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He or, is or, or uh, Tupac who made it twenty Tupac. albums mysteriously after yeah, his death. Yeah. But <laughs> even but Tupac I understand because like yeah. he was a famous rapper. Before before, before right? Sure, Controversial yeah. guy. Pop Smoke I never heard of the guy. <laughs> and, and and Pop Smoke has like three albums. He has a new album coming out. He's dead. And I can guarantee you his family, if, I don't even know if he even had a family, they're maybe not even getting a dime of this. Well, that's tough. Uh, well, new albums after you're dead. Yeah. 
that's a, that's your metaphor for ghost, right? <laughs> Keeps going. It's a deacon. They keep it up. They keep going. No, but by the way, okay, is the Tupac still alive? He recorded hundreds of songs before he died. I just want to make yeah. that clear. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of examples. I mean, I remember, you know, as a you know, we grew up in the nineties, watched Saturday Night Live. Chris Farley, really talented, funny. Yeah. He obviously had a drug problem, he had a heroin problem, and I understood even at the time there was an idea. He's gonna die soon. Let's crank out as many movies as we can 100%. with him. Yeah. He only lived till thirty three. It's not a long life, and. Why not? There's why not this idea? Let's get this guy some help so he can live longer and have a happier life. But they don't always think that way in Hollywood. Right? I mean, I'm just saying Hollywood is not a place of morality. I mean, the world is not a place of morality. The Torah brings morality to the world. Why are Jews hated by popular society, or at least a fragment of popular society that convinces everyone else? Is because Jews challenge the moral and ethical system of the world. That's what Jews do. So when we look at like famous thing when they had the um, the whole um, thing that happened in Surfside, right? With the our, all the apartments, the apartment collapsing, whatever. Sure. So they brought over some of the people from the IDF. They're like yeah. experts in rubble. So they did this press conference, and one of the guys, I think it was CNN, comes up to him. He says, "So how many bodies are we saying are, are, are lost?" And he says, "They're not bodies." This IDF guy corrected him. He said, "They're not bodies. They're human beings." Right. That's right. So we live in a world where they can justify the massacre of, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even millions of people, and just justify it. As we're in Israel, specifically as a nation, if one Jew is being held hostage, they'll do everything sure. to rescue that one Jew. Like Gilad Shalit, for example. Willing to give away prisoners who did horrific crimes to the Jewish people, they're willing to exchange that for one Jewish life. But why do Jewish people care about the Jewish life so much? Why are Jews so compelled to help other Jews? Because that's what the Torah tells us to do. It's not that we just we're different than everyone else because we're just different. No, we are following the Torah. And so when we look at places like Hollywood, Hollywood doesn't care about the talent that makes it money or makes it rich. It doesn't care. And in fact, they the more tragic the story is like look at Amy Winehouse. Right. Amy Winehouse. Record sales went up after the after But a young Jewish girl. Yes. You know? And it's just like she's just there, drugged out, and they were literally counting down. I don't know if you guys remember, they're counting down how long she was going to live. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it was a normal thing, and it was a joke. It was a joke how long she was going to live. And so... Um, and she made the song Rehab. She's trying to express her pain through music. She and, was calling out for help. Yeah. They said, I need a need rehab. And I tell them, no, go, no, go, no, yeah. no. So I'm just saying, like, so Hollywood is a place, like the world, capitalism. I mean, how many companies are dumping toxic waste and killing millions of birds, millions of fish, millions of plant life, sea life? How many rainforests, how many trees are being cut down for the name of profit? How many animals that are on the verge of extinction are just being murdered for their tusk or their skin or whatever? I mean, this is the world we live in. The Torah says, no, these animals are valuable. You have to protect them. You have to treat them with kindness. You have to help them grow and, and create environments for them. Nature itself, you have to go out. You have to make sure that you, you, you pick your garbage up. You, you have sanitation. You, you deal with, uh, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't do things that are going to destroy Hashem's creation. You know, or make it instinct, or put it in pain, or difficulties. We believe everything has a spark of God. Everything living has a spark of God. And even things that aren't Dafka living have a spark of God. That's why they're able to, like a brick, a brick has some elements of God, God, sparks of God inside of it. That's why it's able to be a brick. You know, the same thing with this chair. This chair also has a spark of God. So the point is saying, like, the Jewish world, the Torah itself, and I'm not saying every Jew believes in the Torah that I'm talking about, but the Torah itself is all I'm going off of, and I'm just saying that the world itself is a cruel, brutal place, and it, it allows humans, without the Torah, to do the worst things to nature, to their fellow man, and Hollywood is just a microcosm of people on drugs, people are addicted, and there's literally people waiting for them to die so they could profit from their death. Yeah, I remember when uh, the lockdown started, approximately a year and a half ago, the world in a lot of ways improved, nature improved, yeah. a lot of crime went down, I'm thinking something to the effect of, 
wow, if the world is better without human beings running, that's a problem. It's not the way it is meant to be. Again, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on Israel Sports and News Radio. Also, our <coughs> hopefully Nation of Israel YouTube channel. Our guest is Mordechai Ben Avram. So now we're going to talk about a little bit controversial concepts, anti-Semitism in movies. Even though Jews apparently control Hollywood, sometimes they stick a little bit anti-Semitism or anti-Israel concept in movies. So here's a classic one. There was a movie called Munich, made by Steven Spielberg, the concept of the Mossad unofficially going after blacks of temper and quote-unquote taking revenge. The first half of the movie, if you're a Zionist person, how you like it, it's really strong. And then the second half, they start to, start to say maybe what we're doing is wrong. And I was a bit bothered by that. I don't know if uh, you saw the film, but if so, what, what did you think about that aspect? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. Good for you. <laughs> I, I didn't see it, but I think the important thing that people need to know is that just because someone has Jewish heritage right. does not mean they reflect the Torah's version of what a Jewish person should be. Sure. And so a lot of times, you know, you see people in Hollywood or and in different cases, and they may be Jewish. Perfect example, like a guy, Bernie Madoff, right? Yeah. And it's like you see people like this, and you're like, wait, oh, look at this Jewish guy, blah, 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 blah. He does not reflect Judaism. Right. Just in the same way, like, like you know, you have, a, like, say, in the black community, you may have some guys over there that are, are gangbanging, that are selling crack to their neighbors. That, that doesn't reflect every black person, you right. know, or even black people that are moral and ethical people. You may have, you know, like, say, white people who are racist, that are KKK and you know, pro-Trump and I know what I'm saying. But I'm just saying they may they may be pro, you know, things that are like white supremacist. And the point is just saying that like, but that doesn't reflect all white people. So like when we see, you know, people Jews in the world, you gotta really the non Jewish world needs to say, does that guy keep Shabbat? Right. Does that guy does that guy read the Torah? Does this guy um does he keep kosher? Does he go to the synagogue? You know, um is this family, you know, follow the, the, the laws of purity inside of the home? Because if they don't do that, you can't clump them in with us. You know, you can't clump them in with us because there's been black people, Jewish people, German people, Saudi Arabians, Russian, you know, uh, uh, Iraqi, Swedish, all types of people all over the world who've done at some point in history something horrific. And so the non-Jewish world needs to be able to separate a, a, a Jewish person, this Jewish heritage, and then this Jewish observance. And Jewish observance is an expression of the Torah, and the Torah forbids us to do anything to hurt anyone else. The Torah forbids us to take away from any other life. In fact, the Torah says we should be a light to the nations. It says this in the book of Isaiah. And so the point is just saying that that... Hollywood and the Jews that are in Hollywood does not reflect all the time. There are some religious Jews that work in Hollywood. Sure. But the, the, but the high majority of Jews that are in Hollywood and the things that they're making, you know, are not reflective of Torah or Jewish values. It just so happens that people have Jewish heritage. And within Jewish heritage, there's certain ideas that have been passed on. And some of those ideas have been translated into film and television and music, but it's not reflective. Like the, the Jews who worked in hip hop, you know, if they were Torah observant, Jews would not allow that art form, that destructive art form, to be spread around the world. Hmm. They would have stopped it. You know, you cannot have an art form that dehumanizes a fellow human being. You cannot have a, a art form that dehumanizes women. You cannot have an art form that glorifies the consumption of illegal narcotics that leads to even more violence. So the people, the Jews that are involved in that are not the type of Jewish we are, and it's not reflective of the Torah, and it's not reflective of the righteous people that have existed since Mount Sinai till now that have been fighting to bring the world closer together, who've been looking to elevate all of humanity, and been looking to educate the world on the true values of Judaism. So the Jews that you see in Hollywood are Jewish heritage, but they're not connected to the tradition of the Torah. And so they need to um, make that distinction. I got a question about that. Yes, yeah. be the producer. Behind, right. behind the scenes. Yes. What about a guy like Ben Brafman, who's a Froom guy, he came to speak at a cure organization that I'm mm -hmm. involved with. He was a lawyer for P. Diddy, who had a whole thing of Criminal charges and charge, yeah. what's going on with that. And he tells a story of how P. Diddy called him on Shabbos just to test if he's going to pick up the phone. So you have a from guy who keeps Shabbos, all these things, but then he's defending somebody in Hollywood who had the, you know, shooting charges and whatever it is with his wife and all these kind of things. 
you had that stuff? Um, you know, I, I, if you know Shaquille O'Neal, um, famous NBA player, one of the stories he talks about when he first got his contract was he went out and like bought this like Bentley or something. Yeah. He, he was broken thirty seconds. He spent a million dollars in thirty seconds. He said. Yeah, he's been moved. He said, but it was his Jewish lawyer. Yeah. Who brought him in and said to him, "Hey, if you go this route, you're just going to be another one of these guys it's broke. that that broke and goes out." And not only did he bring him in, but he also brought him in and he spent time with his family. Yeah. Like he would come over for like maybe Shabbat stuff or you know during the day times, whatever. And he used to watch the family culture. So it's nothing wrong with participating in Hollywood as a from Jew. It's just saying, what are you? Are you trying to bring be a light? to the nations are you trying to say hey hey guy this system is not good for you hey here's some ideas here's some tools to kind of like elevate your situation so it's not being involved in the Jewish community I mean being involved in Hollywood or around people who may not even be doing good things may not necessarily be the problem it's what you are contributing as a Jew to that in environment so let's talk about a concept of typecasting kind of sticking with the anti-semitic theme because I have to admit I'm a bit somewhat of a fan of mafia movies you know for whatever reason I'm not saying those people are good but I'm intrigued by them so for example Robert De Niro is a very famous actor in these mafia movies when he's Italian when he's Irish he's a tough guy but in Casino when he plays Ace Rothstein he turns really wimpy all of a sudden so in your experience in Hollywood did you notice typecasting that they make the Jewish guy nerdy or they make the Italian like this or the Irish first ladies or whatever you notice anything like that in your experience in Hollywood you know one of the best one of the best one a really good example to that is the concept of Superman. Okay. So Superman is this guy who's like kind of like this Poindexter type character. Right, Clark Kent. Clark yeah. Clint, you know, he wears his glasses, he's like kind of like quiet guy, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? There's a part of him that he comes from a totally different place and he comes from a totally different reality. You would never know that by seeing him as Clark Kent, but when the world needs help, he'll put on his talus. Oh, okay. His cape, <laughs> like and then he would fly in, from these upper realities and then come down into this world and fix these problems. And so I think that's that's been the the old approach. I'm not saying a lot of people say like that's that's the Jew is Superman. Okay. It's like in everyday life you don't see, but on Shabbos, oh, okay. you know, we become these like super characters that like fix the world. We have Rosh Hashanah coming up. Like the Jewish people are going to be praying for all of humanity. Right. You know. That's right. And so that's our Superman in that way. But you know the thing is, you know my my idea of what Jews were changed dramatically coming to Israel. Okay. Because the Jews that you have here are big, tough, fearless, um, observant, you know, powerful, purpose driven, and the Jew in America. I can't speak for the UK, but I can speak for America. Are very much more timid, much more. Got loot for two thousand years. Yeah, yeah. Low key, more fearful of. Quitting, creating waves. That's why some Jews are like citing to be against Israel, you know, because Israel is creating too much waves, you know. God forbid, you know, we're under nobody's rulership and we can stand up on our own two feet and we don't have to pay a tax to the Muslims and, you know, we can sit at the same table with the Americans and the, and the Brits and, 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 and anyone else in the world and we could do our own trade deals. Like, God forbid that happens, you know, this is the fearful Jew because, you know what, the other people don't like it. Let's just, let's just stay low-key. What was the idea of conservative Judaism in America? Oh, you know what? Let's get out of the religious and just turn everything into tradition. Why? Because the non-Jews believe in tradition. So the more we can mimic the non-Jews, the more we'll be in a safe place, these types of things. And so, you know, the Jew of Israel, the Jew that comes to the IDF, you know, is a lot of times, I'm not saying all the times, but a lot of times is very purposeful. Uh, about their Jewish heritage. I'm not saying I agree with everything that the IDF does or I'm co-signing the government. Governments are governments. You know, governments are convoluted and corrupt anywhere on the planet Earth. But the people themselves, the Jewish people themselves that come here to create a life are, are non-fearful of the other nations and they have a sense of pride about their Jewish history and their Jewish heritage. So if you did movies from that perspective, the world wouldn't even recognize the Jew from Israel, because they're used to a much different type of character. So you didn't follow that on Netflix. Yeah, Fada, yeah. Yeah. But for example, like, were you in certain meetings, and let's say, for example, uh, Dave Chappelle has a writer named Neil Brennan, they, you know, they work together at the Chappelle show and yeah. half-baked in other movies. Neil Brennan told a story, he was in a producer meeting, and he, he suggested 
uh, like two actors for a particular movie, mm -hmm. and the the actor was you know was like uh, I think the lead was black man, sidekick was white man, mm -hmm. and then the producer just said two different actors, but still one black person, one white person. It's like it had to be that way. Mm -hmm. And Chappelle tells a story also that he wanted he was uh, developing a sitcom. He wanted a co-star to be a black woman, and then they said back to him, we want someone with universal appeal meaning not black. So did you notice that where let's say like if you're pitching an idea or you hear an idea being pitched, like we want the character not to look like this or to be like this or a different race or religion, anything like that? Yeah, you know, um, years ago I produced um, this like this TV series. I had a pilot deal with MTV and um, and we went in there and the pilot was about like these like, young black kids that were in the in the inner city and they were using the internet you know to promote music this was like early when you know um, broadband technology was coming out and everyone had these phones and you had this fast access you could do like videos and this whole thing so you had all these kids and they were called the jerkin movement hmm. right and and you could look it up um, j-e-r-k-i-n jerkin movement and skinny jeans movement. So anyways, I was producing a lot of the shows around this. And so I remember um, going to MTV, they had all the, all the executives that were there, and we, they gave us money to shoot a pilot to see how it looked, they loved the idea. And, and we came into the meeting, and the lady told us, I'm really trying to think of her name, but she's one of the producers of the TV show The Hills. And she was there, I don't think, I'm sure she's not there now, but, um, but she, she said to us, she's like, this is one of the best pilots that we've seen produced from at MTV since she's been there. And I was like, oh, wow, we're, this deal's done, you know? <laughs> she said, however, it's, this is not MTV quality. And, and, she, and we're just like, and I was like, okay, why? She said, this is something you gotta um, realize. T television is about escapism, right? She said, I did the movie The Hills. And the movie The Hills was about these like very narcissistic characters, that were overindulgent and just kind of like did whatever they wanted. And so when people come home from work, that's who they want to see. They want to see characters that they could kind of escape. Television is about escapism. So what you're doing in this pilot is real. It's about people with real struggles, real life, overcoming it, using what they can. And people don't want to be faced with that type of reality when they come home from work. They want to come home, have their TV dinner. Escape from... Uh, excuse me, actually, right, uh, not be part of the Matrix. Exactly. Or, no, oh, no. The other way, man. They, yeah, they want to be a part of the Matrix. Yes, even, to distract themselves. 100%. Okay. And even to the point, like, they want people just to come back, have pizza with the, 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 the dopamine and the cheese in it, right. and then the beer, and all these different things, and they want people to be... Unhealthy soda. Well, they call it the alpha state. Okay. And you get to this state in your mind where you have like beers or whatever. Now they got marijuana. That's a new thing. And you get to the state and you're just sitting there and you zone out. And then that's when you're more suggest you're uh, more suggestible to commercials. Yeah, pick up the advertising that way. So if you're critically analyzing these types of things, it would make you too smart or too on top of it to maybe you look at that commercial and be like, oh, that's not for me, versus right. like, oh, let me go, how could I get there, you know, let me go and get the next video, let me get this next slushy. let me get this next, you know, barbecue wings, you know, whatever. So the point is, is like television is about escapism. And I had another meeting, I, I had a meeting once with Sony, and it was about a similar similar show, and, and the same show, we went to MTV, they're like, no, okay, so we're like, you know what, MTV let us use this pilot, so we took it somewhere else. Sony said to me in a meeting, She's all, but none of these kids have tattoos, and none of them are carrying guns. That's what people want to see. Bring us those type of characters in a story like this. They actually said that I came you. out in, in my face as a black person. I was sitting there pitching the show, and he says, we need guys with tattoos. We need guys that, are, that have guns in this type of a context, and that's what we want to see. You know what you're describing? Wow. You know Rabbi Alona Nava, he talks about all this kind of stuff that you're talking about. He just calls these people Arab run. Hmm. Because what they do is they own the, all the studios and they bring all the best and this and this and this, but they have an agenda. They have that agenda that you're describing. Yeah. And that's the era of Rav agenda. Exactly. That's it. And I used to work for a record company. I'm not going to say the name because I want to be on good graces with them. Okay. But even then, like I remember when I was doing stuff in music, they were like, we don't want any of this conscious stuff. <laughs> we want street stuff from the gutter. And I was like, I'm just... You actually said this out loud. To me in my face. These are normal conversations. Wow. 
This is real stuff. Like this is. And I've been telling friends about how hip hop used to be the conscious stuff. And no, they don't want it at all. No more. But I'm saying it's not because it's a lack of it. The studio, the companies are not going to push it out. A lot of these music companies, if you look at how they're owned, they're, they're part of an uh, umbrella, right. like holding company. Yeah. And a lot of these holding companies are also prison, own privately owned prisons. So they're producing the music and the imagery that's leading to these kids to want to live a street life, which ultimately leads them to their jails and their prisons. They're in prison that makes money for the companies and the prisons. Yeah. Wow. So they're making money all the way across so the board. It, if only people could use that mind for the good, because that is a complicated process. You know, it's like Bernie Madoff, right? Mm -hmm. Bernie Madoff would have chose to do something good. Imagine what he could have done. A brilliant man. What he did was evil, but brilliant to come up with. I can't even... One time I was in a business course and I asked them to explain to me what a Ponzi scheme is. And I'm like, I'm done. I don't understand this. Thank you. So just to explain it is complicated. He mastered it, but he, he did a obviously in a negative way. Uh, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on the Israel Sports and News Radio.com and also the Nation of Israel YouTube channel. Our, our guest is Mordecai Ben Abram. You know, we spoke a little negative things, anti-Semitic things, different things. Let's speak out something positive, uh, this concept of movies that have positive ideas in it. And you mentioned the 80s, more real movies, so let's talk about Rocky IV because Rocky, at the end, after he beats uh, Drago, talks about a concept of change. He can change, they can change, everyone can change. My friend Raphael Katz watching is a big fan of that speech. That's Teshuva. Yeah. And, and Sylvester Stallone actually is Jewish. His mother comes from Jewish lineage. She's technically Jewish. So he mentioned Teshuva in the speech at the end of Rocky IV. So uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, yeah. R Rocky was great for... Um the American idea, right? Yes. Like we beat the Russians. Right. In persistence. Right. And <laughs> we were hardworking. Even our most little guy. Right. The guy, you know, was not our big fighter. First, he beats up the black guy, right? Mr. T. He, yeah. he, he, he wipes him out. No, the one oh, with Apollo, the, Creed. Apollo Creed. Yeah. He wipes him out. Okay, he takes care of the, the little white guy, takes care of the black guy. Right. Then. Mr. T, the bigger guy. Yeah, then he takes out. Bigger than Apollo Creed. Yeah, then he be, takes out the even ultra big, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, black guy. Then. Later on, he fights the most structured Russian right. that, you know, is just real. I mean, like, he, his cheekbones had were flexing, you know what he I mean? He looked like, a little bit like a Nazi, no offense. actually Danish. He's Danish, he's Danish, Danish Dolph Lundgren. No offense totally. If, if Dolph he's Lundgren, PhD, PhD, very smart guy, no offense to Dolph Lundgren is watching, but even though he was supposed to rush the movie, he looked a little bit like a Nazi. Like, he looked like he had blonde hair. Maybe I'm mistaken. And the, the way his posture, but... So the idea that the little American guy... The little white guy. The little, little white, white guy. Yeah, got to put it in perspective. Yeah. And another thing I noticed in that movie, again, the speech is great, but they say things like Rocky versus the Russian. They mm -hmm. didn't necessarily want to call him by his name. The Russians jab, the Russians reach, and Rocky gets the name, yeah. like a human being name, and then yeah. the other guy is this robot. And he doesn't show a lot of emotion. He's, he's, he's cold. He's cold. He's cold. He yeah. doesn't care that he killed Apollo Creed. Yeah, yeah, he's thing. heartless. He's just heartless guy. But even with all of that, there's still the positive message of repentance. Wait, you, you, I forgot. The Russian guy kills the black guy. Yes, well, right. Yeah, yeah. He, he By just, the way, the Russian guy, when he's already da almost down and out that it, with, it, with this fight with Rocky, he, sa he says two things. He says, his face is made of steel. I well, can't... Well, not his face. And his then body. he says, no, he he's says, made in of Russian, steel. he says, oh, when, in you Russian. Talk, when you go to talk like his face, his face is made of steel. Okay. Oh, wow. And then he says, I, uh, I keep the victory for myself, not for my country, right. for myself. Yes. So he, oh, he said son. that. So he has a, I, let's speak Russian. So. Yeah. Wow. So he said, so that means he has a consciousness about himself. It's an individual. He's a selfish not, guy, not, not the country. For, uh, an American guy, he was fighting for the country. Yeah. Oh, that's a interesting concept. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I mean, I, I'm into it. I'm into it. I'm just, you know what it is? Like, for me, it's like, you know, one of the greatest gifts for me being Jewish, it allowed me to reconcile the African-American experience. Mm. Because for me, media has been something, been used to subconsciously and even consciously undermine my whole culture that I came from, to keep us into a, like a small box, you know, how many slavery movies do we need to see? You know, like just keeping us in this place of pain, you know, not dealing with no form of social progression. Every aspect of our culture is like a joke. It's like comedy, these different things. So for me, I really dislike Hollywood. You know what I mean? Like for me, there's nothing really positive about it other than showing us that the world that we live in is full shucker. So like for me, it's just like music, like hip hop is such a disgusting art form. 
You know what I mean? It's just, it's so horrendous, like what it does to the mind, what it does to the soul, what it does in terms of a pe person's outlook on humanity, not just black people, anybody who listens to it, you know? And so like for me, it's like the media thing is just like, it's such a, a tremendous cancer to the world. It's such an evil device, you know, it's been used to just destroy people, destroy psychology, destroy families. It's like, you know, you think about the Bundys, you know, the TV show. Married with Children. Married with Children. Yeah. That was a direct attack at the American family. Right. You know, it was undermining the father, it was making the woman, the superficial, the kids don't care anymore. The Simpsons. Yeah, Bart calls his dad by his first name. Yeah, just undermining the family. So I'm just saying, like, these things were just like, and it's like the more divided families are, the less that people have the ability to, you know, have critical thinking. They become more reliant on the government. Right. You know, family structure is the antithesis to government because family structures allow people to, like, look at the black community. The most powerful time in the black community was the civil rights movement, right? Well, what was going on then? Those were black families that made money because they lived in a segregated reality where they only got black-owned businesses, right? So you have black-owned hotels, black-owned you know, restaurants, black-owned this, this, whatever, because they weren't allowed to participate. So those families were the ones who funded the civil rights movement. Mm. And that's where all that money came from. Right after the civil rights movement, what happened? Drugs, heroin, crack, hip-hop, welfare, guns, violence. Pimps, pushers, gangsters, th that, that became the whole thing. Yeah. So I really dislike Hollywood. I dislike everything it stands for. For me, there's nothing positive out of, hip, out of, out of, out of Hollywood other for the elite who are using these images to conquer the minds of people around the world. Yeah, you know, you mentioned hip-hop. One more thing I want to mention of a hip-hop movie, which I remember the story from a long time ago, was I was watching this movie with a friend of mine. It was 8 Mile with Eminem. I mean, meaning it was coming on TV, and I already saw it. And I'm like, you know what happens at the end of this movie is Eminem gets in a rap battle with this other guy, and the way he wins is he, it's him versus a black guy at the end of the, of the movie, and he says, he talks about these things like, Clarence lives at home with both parents, and Clarence's parents have a really good marriage, and Clarence went to private school, school mm -hmm. and the whole crowd boos this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an insult yeah. in that world, and I'm thinking, that's insane. Well, uh, it was I, in that movie. Well, I, I'll give you the best one on this idea, and this is the way that African-American intelligence in the family structure was attacked. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Okay. Right? Everybody saw Fresh Prince of yeah, Bel-Air. Sure. So the guy who has a two-parent household, who, who, who parents are successful, yeah. has a family, everyone's taken care of, they have a house of love, he's the nerd. Right. No, he, the nerd, he, yeah. he can't even dance like a black person. Right. He's completely ostracized. And the guy who comes from the broken family, right. you know, who's the, the, the smooth, the, the, he's, yeah. the, he's the star of it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, look at that imagery. I don't want to be like Carlton. I want to be like the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Right. S Steve Urkel. Right. Right. He's the nerd. He's the nerd. He's a smart guy. Yeah. Did I do that? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if we look at if we look at how Hollywood has took in imagery and distorted it to make the people who Americans should aspire to be like. The people who have families, the people who have homes, the people who have love, these different things. It's like, those have been the images that Hollywood has took and distorted them. You know, the Cosby Show is actually very positive. Not just for black people, for Americans in general. Right. You know, and... and He's a doctor and the... the yeah. And they were funny and they got along and there's this whole upper middle class type of a existence, this whole thing. But I'm just saying, when we look at the images and we look at how, what role they have played on society... As Jews, we have to be disgusted and we have to, like, have sadness. Like, you know what? Like, these people, like, because Jews, we represent family values, right? We, we the whole idea, the, the family, B'nai Israel, the children of Yaakov, right? The children of Israel. That's the basis of the Jewish experience, that we're children of a father in a family. And so when you see the world going against family values and these different things, this is an indirect attack at the Torah. These are the things that make anti-Semitism normalized. When these people are anti-Semitic in America and going around places, these people for sure do not believe in family values. They do not care about family. They don't care about the life of unborn children. They don't care about any of these things that, you know, even justice, even 
you know, uniformity, even ethics, morals. Now, any deviant behavior you have, you can start an organization right. and, and, and get followers around it. And if someone goes against it, you know, back in the day, people used to be scared of deviant behaviors. They used to go places to get it worked on and, 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 and work on it. And if they had it, they would keep it concealed. Now, you're not cool if you don't have a certain taiva, you know? It's like, whatever your taiva is, is cool. And then it's like, now we have this Hollywood that's just reinforcing it, reinforcing these things. So all these different ideas that go against the Torah, these are the undertones that fuel anti-Semitism. It's not the guy who says, oh, I don't like Jews, or I don't like Israel. It's what it represents underneath it. Israel represents the small guy becoming big. The masses do not want that. The masses in Europe do not want that. The masses in the Middle East do not want that. Even the masses in Asia do not want that. America was a problem for that exact reason. Now America is the big guy. But in the inception of America, people were not for America. You know, the, 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 the communist, the, 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 um, the iron fist, the, the curtain, they didn't agree with America. That was most of the world held by this ideology. Right. And, and so it's just saying that like when we look at the world critically, any ideas that are perpetuated that go against the Torah, even though we may laugh at it because we don't even think it's connected, it's an attack against the, it's, a, it's an attack against the Torah and it's a, it's a fuel to anti-Semitism. Everything you see that goes against the Torah in society is, is a fuel to or kesher to anti-Semitism. Everything that you see. And that's why we have to be vigilant. And that's why they look at the Haredi Jew or the Jew in Meritrim and like, oh, we don't want anything to do with it. We want to be separate. They're like, oh, you guys are ancient. Join the modern world. Just look at Netflix. Just watch this. Just do these things. It's like, this is against you. When the Jewish people were going to Ahasuerus' meal, that was a celebration against the Jewish Masur, saying, oh, this isn't true. Let's celebrate it. Every movie that we watch, is remind, that, that goes against Torah ideas and Torah values is just like going to Akashverus' meal and celebrating with him because that is an attack directly against who we are as people and exactly what our mission is in this world. Because mm, there are, fortunately, media in Israel sometimes those anti karate things, anti karate messages, right? Yeah, I'm not, and, I'm not, and that's another thing. I mean, that's a separate thing, but I'm just saying we can learn something from the Haredi community in that way. I'm not going to the, the politics of Haredi versus not in Israel. I'm saying the Haredi community has a stark stance against outside influences. Right. And I'm not saying everyone needs to be Haredi or Haredi politics are what's going to help Israel. I'm not saying that, and I'm not saying they're not either. But I'm just saying, the point is saying we can learn things from people as a collective. And one of the things we can learn from the Haredi community is the effects and the damages of those. Look at, I mean, like women. Look, like now they made women, they took women away from what it is to be a woman, and now women just want to compete with men. And then now, men are trying to compete with women. Men are trying to join women's sports. Yes, yeah. I mean, look how upside down everything is. Why can't we say, wow, look at the Selim Elohim of, a, of the woman, the Selim Elohim of a man. Wow, look how diverse we are. Look how different we are. Look how uniquely woven we are, how much we need each other. They're taking away that completely. And so all these different small things are a direct attack against the Torah. And the stronger and normal and the more normalized these ideas are, they're an attack against, or they're 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 a fuel to anti-Semitism. By the way, I, that first person really blew my mind because I thought for a long time that was a very pro-black show because you have Uncle Phil as a judge, yeah. and his wife is a professor. But then you think about, it, you're right. They consistently called Carlton white. Yeah, and they said it away to make fun of him. He's white. He's not really black. Will is black. His sisters too. Yeah, well, uh, it's true. They st stick it in there. It's very clever how they did that. Uh, I don't know if Jewish writers were involved. I hope not. Uh, I guess this evening has been more Ben Avram. Now I know that you have a couple of lectures coming up yeah. and a very special event this Friday night. So tell us a bit about it. Yeah. So this Shabbat, um, we're working with uh, JIC. Um, shout outs to Jody and Gavin, founders of JIC. Uh, we're basically having a Shabbat under the sun. You know, right over here in Eric Refaim. Well, with, under the stars. Yeah, under the stars. Yeah, <laughs> which is reflective of the sun. <laughs> but um, we're going to be under the stars um, Shabbos night, and basically, you know, like me and my wife are hosting, and. We're basically going to talk a little bit about our how we found each other. We both come from very different backgrounds, and you know, but both met at a Shabbat meal. Right? And we both met at a Shabbat meal, okay. and um, we're going to talk about that. But we're going to utilize our story to create an openness with the people who attend this event. 
that you know they could open their eyes and say hey you know what maybe this person is a little bit different than what i thought i would go for but let me go and say hi or let me follow up with this person after shabbat or not to make plans on shabbos but the point is just saying like you know just create shabbos correct yeah 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 but just just, we just want to create an environment where there's no judgment um and it's just an open environment and we're just going to utilize a little bit about our story maybe a little bit of Torah inside of that to just get the juices flowing and you know, people got to get married, you know, yeah. at the end of the day. You know, I've been married for three whole months and um Baruch Hashem. But I'm just saying, like, it's um, it's the real reality, you know. It's it's a real reality. And it's not to say that not, but there's a, there's a famous Gemara that says that when a man's not married, he doesn't have the protective walls around him. Right. And in order to study deep levels of Torah, you got to have protection around you from the Yitzhahara, from the Satan. So, I, you know, my thing is just like just helping as many people get married. So whoever comes tonight, I mean, uh, Friday night, you know, I'm going to be vigilant to try to like connect people and get people to connect. And if anything, we just have a beautiful Shabbat that, you know, awakens something inside of our soul that if we don't meet our soulmate that night, that that energy we're carrying with us is going to attract the right person in our life. Or it could help maybe another friend as well. That Also, those things happen. Yeah. Uh, so they can go to JICNY on Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah. Just go on, go on, yeah, go on J, JIC Israel. Um, and you could do that. Or you could go on my page, you know, Mordecai Yosef Ben Abraham. Um, you can see the whole thing. But this is going to be a big fun. It's going to be a big party. A lot of Lachimes. They're doing a lot of Lachimes that night. So, you know, we got to elevate. And, um, so yeah, it'd be great just for people to come out and, and really um, enjoy themselves. You know, they talk about maybe we may be going to a lockdown, right. God forbid. But if we do, this may be one of the last big Shabbos that before people, that happens, before right. that happens. So yeah. it's, it's a really good, gotta enjoy it, gotta enjoy it while, while it's there and um, we'll see what happens. And you have a book coming out as well. You have a book, Mind of the Black Jew, which is basically um, a Hashkafa Musa Sefer, which is like outlook, how to see the world a certain way. You know, I did a lot of speeches, you know, here in Israel, even in, in America, but mostly here in Israel, and talk about my story, how I became Jewish, and my path of being in yeshiva, and this whole thing. And one of the things I realized is that people want to know about the thinking process. What makes a person think? You know, um, what, what is the thinking process that makes a person want to leave everything behind and to take on the Torah and to change their life completely? So that book goes into that thinking process. And, and often, even another thing too, I feel like, you know, African Americans a lot of times were like marginalized by the media. People see us as these like athletes and, you know, we have these, you know, these, these, these phys we're very physical body parts and all these different external qualities of, of, of black people that are very much perpetuated in film and television and music. And so I wanted to just shift the discourse to intellect. Like, we have so many great African Americans that are not even Jewish, but specifically ones that are Jewish. What is the thinking process that they have? What do they, how do they overcome the matrix that allowed them to be able to see the truth in, in, inside of Judaism and those types of things? So it's just full of sources, and it's not really so much about race at all. It's um, because a person who's a black Jew isn't thinking about race because that's a Western construct that has nothing to do with the Torah, you know. But so it doesn't talk so much about that. So I'm sorry to disappoint people that are looking for the struggle of the black man in the book. They're not going to get that. They're going to get the elevation of a human soul that's connected to the Torah. All right. Also, I want to give myself a plug. I'm going to be lecturing this Shabbat during Sudash Shishit at the Emic Learning Center. That's 64 Emic Refined Street in Jerusalem. The topic is called the conception of Yitzchak. So you could, I guess, go to the dinner Friday night. Which is Rosh Hashanah. That's right. So uh, I hope I didn't ruin it. Man. No, it's, it's okay. I'm going to yeah. have a lot of sources to do a lot of fun. So maybe people can go to the dinner Friday night and hear me speak uh, Sudash Shishit or do one or the other or... Just have a good time. Whatever you're doing Shabbat, have a good time. I definitely enjoy Shabbat. You know, Mark, I want to say you are our first guest that has been on for the second time since oh, we started the podcast. Such an honor to be here. So thank you for coming on again. It's been great again. Yeah. We're going to have to have it on again. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you also, everyone, for tuning in. Another episode of the Ari Lewis Show here on Israel Sports News Radio, also on the Nation of Israel YouTube page. God bless and good night.